Okay. Hi, um, Paul Kirby. Uh, we're at the, the Daily Freeman. I'm a reporter here along with uh, senior editor uh, Alan Lahara. And today, our guests for the live stream video are two top executives uh, with Central Hudson Gas uh, and Electric Corporation. And we uh, welcome you, gentlemen, and thanks for coming by. Uh, they will introduce themselves uh in in a second um and do, do a little background and then they're gonna give us the reasons uh they uh, wanted to come here to uh discuss some issues so go ahead gentlemen hey good morning um i'm charlie frenny i'm the president and ceo of central hudson gas and electric i've been in this role for a little bit more than a year but i've been with the company for more than 37 years i've served in a variety of roles across the organization from engineering to customer services um, to district operations. So I have a pretty broad experience over that time frame, And uh, it's really put me in, a, I think, a good position to be able to lead this company going forward, um, especially with what we're facing today with the vast um, opportunities that new renewables provide. And I'm Anthony Campagione. I'm Vice President of Customer Services and Regulatory Affairs at Central Hudson. I've been with Central Hudson uh, for 10 years in a variety of roles. Uh, almost a lifelong Hudson Valley resident. Grew up in, here in Ulster County, went to Highland High School, and uh, uh, live in Fishkill now. Um, I think Charlie's right. There's a lot going on in the industry um, and a lot of movement uh, throughout the energy industry and a lot of uh, interesting policy questions that we have and we'd like to talk a little bit more about that today. Okay, good. Um, all right, Anthony and Charles, go, you, you know, just uh, dig in and, um, and um, tell us why you're here. Okay, so I, I think it's only appropriate to start with you know, talking about the weather, um, given that we had a nor nor'easter that came through last night and uh, it has created some problems, uh, I think, across the Northeast. Um, we have um, crews working in the field. We probably have less than um, 6,000 customers out at this point in time. But not only do we have our own resources, we have uh, contract resources that are on the property that are available to help speed up the restoration. Um, wind is really the primary um, source of the problems, um, you know, trees falling into the lines, breaking branches, trees coming down. Um, so it's quite likely going to be an all-day event, given um, the nature of the weather that we're looking at. But I can assure you that we'll be there. Um, we'll be on the job until we get everybody restored. Um, and we obviously um, will be posting information on our website, sending out um, text messages for those customers that have signed up for the text messaging service and our contact center um, will certainly be available as well. So I think it's only appropriate to start with that okay. um, and let everybody know that uh, while we're here today talking, um, there's the, the full force of the organization is out there making sure power gets restored to our customers. I'm sure that the customers are seeing them out there. I hope so. Yeah. In the buckets. So. Uh, okay. So, and you know, it's, uh, I think it's always important to note um, uh, that Central Hudson is very much a community-based organization. You know, we are in the Hudson Valley, unlike some of the other utilities in the state, you know, we have a contiguous service ter territory within the Hudson Valley. Our employees are Hudson, Hudson Valley residents. Um, and so, you know, they take great pride in what they do each and every day in serving um, our customers, which essentially are their friends, neighbors, and family as well. Um, and I think that's really something that, that um, can't be overlooked um, because we've been here more than 100 years. We plan to be here um, at least another 100 years, if not longer. Um, we're very much vested in this community, and um, that's where our focus is. So um, it's, I think, uh, something that's a, an advantage that we have, um, you know, knowing Hudson Valley and the people of Hudson Valley. Um, so there's obviously an awful lot going on in our industry. Um, it's really kind of an exciting time to think of the amount of technology that's moving into um, the industry space, and I, and I really kind of um, believe that, you know, we're more of an energy company than a utility um, today. It's important for us to be able to kind of leverage the opportunity and the technology um, that becomes available to best serve our customers and obviously reach to the need for our customers and what's important to them. Um, you know, for, for Central Hudson, um, you know, certainly uh, we support uh, some of the uh, many ambitious goals, I should say all of the ambitious goals that the state has established um, when it comes to renewables and um, you know, move, moving to a cleaner environment. So um, we fully support what's going on, and I can talk a little bit about some, some of the things that we're doing. Um, it's, you know, the Hudson Valley um, is um, really been um, kind of a hot spot in New York State for the installation of, of solar, both rooftop and community solar. You know, we've seen in the Hudson Valley more than uh, 9,000 installations 
more than 100 megawatts of um, solar installed. And just to put the 100 megawatts in context, you know, our peak um, uh, load during a summer day is about 1,100 megawatts. So while we have a lot of installations, it's still a small amount, but it's progress. It's a step in the right direction. Um, and so um, that obviously offers um, benefits um, to um, the energy sector um, and offers benefits um, to the Hudson Valley as well. New York has actually um, done pretty well when it comes to clean energy, um, particularly upstate New York, where probably mo nearly 90% of the energy generated in upstate New York is clean energy. Um, downstate New York is um, has a little bit less, and I think geography pay plays a, a part in that. But I think what also is a big challenge is being able to move energy from upstate to downstate because there are constraints on, on the transmission system. So, um, you know, one of the things that we believe is an important um, opportunity for um, not only our customers to get access to clean energy, but um, also um, to be able to take advantage of the development upstate is create um, transmission to move energy from upstate to downstate. There is a project that um, has been approved um, that will increase the transfer capability uh, from upstate to downstate by about 2,000 megawatts, which is a good start. But what we're really seeing in the state of New York is many new solar installations, particularly large installations, are taking place upstate. And you know, without that capacity to move it downstate, those installations really just displace other clean sources of energy. Um, mm -hmm. So um, it's certainly, um, I think, um, an opportunity um, to be able to continue to um, uh, offer more and more clean energy in the state. It, on that topic, I guess, um, you know, the legislature is now dealing with um, um, uh, um, uh, laws or law that would allow you get to utilities like Central Hudson to once again participate in the creation of energy if you do it with renewable stuff like wind. Mm -hmm. What's your what's your what's your thoughts on that? That would be a whole new uh, that would be a whole uh, a, a big thing for you guys, wouldn't it? Yeah, so we we believe um, in a market system. We believe that um, you know if in fact the market is attracting um, developers to be able to provide um, renewable energy and it's meeting the needs of our customers, um, we, we believe that um, it should allow the markets to work. Um, and truly allowing the markets to work means essentially removing incentives and allowing the market to kind of drive the development. So there's quite a few incentives today, which makes New York a very attractive state. But I think when, you, when it comes to being able to provide our customers the best price, we should have an opportunity to be able to develop and, and provide um, renewable energy to our customers if, in fact, we can provide it um, at a lower cost and where the market is not responding. And, you know, where the market um, maybe um, isn't seeing the progress that we expect to see. I mean, I would certainly hope that, you know, we um, uh, will be installing batteries um, to support our system. Um, I certainly think that, um, you know, deploying um, uh, charging stations is, is, is an important step as well um, in the development of them. But the opportunity to be able to create community solar facilities to be able to serve all of our customers. Um, and help offset any fossil fuel generation, um, I believe that we should um, have that opportunity if we can be competitive there. Um, and, and like, you know, just expect, what would you do? Like, you know, build wind things like you see in Cape Cod and yeah. that kind of thing? So, um, so um, I, you know, and I have to look at the technology that's available today, yeah. Yeah. you know, without necessarily understanding what the technology tomorrow would be. But I think today, you know, one of the opportunities is really the community solar, where you build the solar field and you allow customers to be able to um, be able to receive a share of that. Yes. Um, you know, it can also be just, you know, generation into our system that helps offset um, generation uh, energy, that, electricity that we need to buy that may be, um, uh, you know, from um, gas generation or other sources. Um, solar is probably the most likely opportunity. It's okay. much more economical to be doing it on a large scale than roof by roof by roof. You know, it is it's significantly more from a rooftop perspective than from a, from a community solar perspective. The, um, um, there are some, uh, there's an Albany-based group, I guess, that represents like little producers. Mm -hmm. uh, and he told, this is a- IPNI? Yes. Independent Power Producers. Yes, yes, yes. 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 And he, 
he uh, said that time and time again, the private sector and independent power producers have uh, proven to be the innovators of change and technological advancement uh, we need to rise to meet the challenges ahead. And he's referring to the state's adoption of uh, uh, carbon zero by 2025. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. And then he says, uh, our grid is more efficient than ever before, and it's only improving. There is no good argument to move away from that progress. I mean, he thinks Central Hudson should not be allowed to get into this business. And how do you respond to something like that? Yeah, so um, he, he's certainly um, you know, representing that sector, and I would expect that's what his position in that particular sector would be. Um, but I think when you really kind of look at the grid, um, you know, they're, they're on the generation end. They are not um, on the distribution end. So, you know, the grid is a big piece of that. But also you have to look at, you know, kind of their situation. I mean, they are not actually capable of, you know, kind of delivering everything to the market. I mean, upstate right now, what's really critical to clean energy are the uh, nuclear plants. And those plants today are receiving um, over a 12-year period. Um, essentially uh, zero emission credits, they call them ZEX, to be able to be even um, viable um, because they have to compete against um, other other sources of energy. And when they compete against that, they don't produce enough revenue. So, closing, right? Indian Point so Indian Point is closing, but upstate New York through ZEX, they have a 12 year agreement. It's, it's a quite costly agreement. When the agreement was put together, um, the agreement essentially expected to pay about $2.9 billion to those plants upstate to be able to keep them running. Um, that was based on a projection of the price of fuel. Price of fuel has gone down and, and it, the, those costs could approach $9 billion to keep those open. I'm not sure what happens after, um, you know, after um, the 12 years or whether they're in a bargaining position. But, um, you know, I think when it comes to serving customers, um, I think that if you try to limit any particular sector, then you're really saying that um, I'm not necessarily interested in the best solution. I'm interested in my solution. So, you know, if you're truly competitive, like many free market operations are, they don't prohibit competitors coming into the marketplace. Which is what's being done to you now. Right. right? You and know, it started in the 80s. Right. right. And I mean, so you've done this before, created. That, that's energy. right. And so, you know, our customers, what our customers want is choice. And what our customers have said is that we want choice, but we want you to be one of our choices. Okay. And so, you know, that then certainly leads us the opportunity to be able to um, develop a viable business case, demonstrate to our customers that it, it offers a competitive advantage. You can't lose sight of the fact that a utility has a, um, the opportunity to get capital at maybe lower rates than free markets. Um, we have um, very good credit ratings. Um, the price of uh, money today is very low. And sometimes that provides a competitive advantage. Now, I don't think that um, you can um, dismiss a competitor because they have a competitive advantage if it provides the ultimate consumer yeah. a benefit or an opportunity. So that's why I say you really need to look at what is best for the consumer and not what's, not what's best for each sector. Let's say the legislature passed this next session, which would be uh, January, sometime between January and March or June, and, 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 and actually gives you permission to get into this business. How how quickly can Central Hudson do this? And if 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 you have to build these solar farms uh, or any kind of other power generating thing, is 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 the cost of this uh, going to um, you know be paid by ratepayers or customers? I mean, will the rates go up? Yeah. So um, kind of like speed to market. This would be uh, really kind of looking at you know where's the best opportunity and what would what would we like to do. You know, quite likely we'd partner with somebody that's familiar with building these facilities to be able to bring it to market quicker. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, we would, um, you know, many times uh, we've actually d d done a design before that we presented to the Public Service Commission early on in the um, REV proceedings. Um, it was actually located in Ulster County in the Sarbides area along the throughway. We thought it offered a good opportunity for our customers and we demonstrated with that. It was far more economical than, than a rooftop. Would that likely be the first place one goes? That could be. That yeah. could be. I, I, you know, I think the market is, I mean, when you look at kind of the demographics and that's about things have changed, we look at circuits and understand where it's the best opportunity and look at where we could provide the opportunity for customers to gain access to green power.
And I also think you have to look at, when you ask the question about independent power producers, the legislation that was recently passed is very aggressive now. Yeah. And so you have to have all options on the table. And to Charlie's point, the market is not responding, which it hasn't. We have essentially 11 years to go 70% renewable generation and electric generation. So right. you yeah. have to put all options on the table. And we certainly have to be considered as one of the opportunities to do that. We were prohibited in 2000 from being in the generating business. Having that opportunity, maybe re-looking at the new policies, yeah. us getting back in into the generation game makes some sense. And so we have to look at all options if we're going to meet these aggressive goals. Right. Uh, and if you uh, aren't allowed to be involved, uh, you don't think those goals will ever, will ever will ever get reached? If utility company, not just you, but utility companies are not allowed to get involved in the power generating thing, that those goals that the government has set. Um, can't be reached it's, in 11 years. It's challenging, right? And, and our history's told us we haven't met previous targets and goals. And so we have to do something differently this time if we're going to meet the goals. And so they've been challenging. And again, we believe in markets first and making sure market opportunities are available. But if we're going to subsidize it, another major principle that Charlie articulated is we want to pursue uh, the lowest cost approach to emission reductions. And I think that's a really important um, note for our customers. If we're going to pursue clean energy, we have to do it at the lowest cost because cost is a factor here. Oh, I got this question from somebody in the newsroom who had solar, you know, on the roof, right? right? What happens to that um, once you guys start building your own solar farms? Is, it, is, is, is there any adverse effect to those people who have already installed solar power around their homes? It's not knowing his, the individual's particular circumstances. I would yeah. say there's really no adverse effect associated with it because... Um, generally, what an individual is doing with whatever investment agreement they put together, whether yeah. they just chose to own it or lease it, is that they're just essentially offsetting their own energy bills. Yeah, yeah, their their own energy. And the other thing that is happening is that um, generally those those um, facilities are built, um, you know, so that they create more energy that's needed at a particular hour. So it pushes energy also to the grid as well as right. for um, their own use. And then at night, you know, when it's not producing, they're pulling energy back to the grid and it's netting out. Um, you know, that mod we're moving away from that model. That's called net metering. Yes. Um, and, right. they, and moving to more, um, you know, valuing um, the energy for what it, what it really is that comes to the grid. If he's in a system today where he's net metered, he's, he's in that agreement for the next 20 years. So, so I would say that his impact would be less. But the reality of it is, if you're generating um, energy and I'm buying energy, you know, and just to, to make up numbers, if I'm buying energy at, at four cents yes. and you're choosing to generate energy and offsetting what I'm buying, I should pay you the four cents. Yes. What I'm paying them today is much more than um, the four cents. And so not only are they offsetting the cost of energy, that they're getting paid for delivery services, which um, they are not providing. I mean, when I speak about delivery services, what I'm talking about is everything to be able to that, that is necessary to connect to, to the grid, which is you know supporting the distribution system, supporting the restoration of the system out there today. You know, the person has to generate the bill, read the meter, uh, the contacts in it. So uh, it, uh, those costs get offset, and so. The way our rates are established, if that particular customer doesn't pay them, those costs get allocated to all of our other customers. So going back to my uh, original question, though, when you if, if you guys get allowed to, to, to be involved in generating energy and you're building these solar farms, I guess we can mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, you know, is the cost of building those uh, farms, is it is it likely that customers will see their rates rise in order to pay for those building of those farms? So the intent would not be to see everybody's rates rise. I mean, I think it's no different than any other business. The only place those businesses get money to pay for their operation and the cost yeah. is from their customers. I right. mean, we don't print money in the basement as much as I'd like to. Um, but um, so what you'd really try to do is, I mean, you're going to put together a business case. And so there's going to be output associated with that facility. And you would want customers to, sub to subscribe to that facility um, and the price of the energy for which they subscribe to should offset the cost of the energy. So if you're not participating in, in, the, in the facility, you, you're not supporting it. But you also have to think about, you know, what are the societal benefits of moving in that direction? And so should all That's customers, what this is really about, right? right. It's so not really about saving anybody any money. 
yeah, there's a lot of societal benefits. And so, yeah. So when you come to societal benefits, societal benefits, which is means everybody's benefiting, then um, from a societal benefit perspective, everybody should pay as well. But, and you have to understand something that the st- we don't make the policy. We're trying to conform to it. And so yeah, yeah. customers are already paying a great deal for clean energy in New York State. And all we're saying is if we can do it cheaper than they're currently doing it through some of the subsidy structures that they have, we should at least be afforded the opportunity. And Charlie says, make a business case to look at it. If we can do it more cheaply than they're doing it currently, why shouldn't customers benefit from that? And that's simply our, our case on this. Right. So if you look today, Central Hudson customers, just Central Hudson customers. Yes spend about $70 million a year, every single year, um, for supporting the state's clean energy goals. And that's sent up to NYSERDA, and that's how customers that put rooftop solars on get get incentives. That's how other developers get incentives from all that money. When you look at what's on the table today, if you're gonna add, you know, 6,000 more megawatts of solar, you know, 9,000 megawatts of wind. If, you're allowed to if, get you, if all of those yeah. things happen, regardless of whether we do it, other people well, do it. Yeah, yeah you're, you're talking about um, multiples of that $90 million coming from our customers. They may be paying right. three or four times that amount to be able to um, reach those goals. And So, know, but if a customer, if, and um, I just, this is a simple question, but. If, if a customer has what he has now, central huts and he gets electricity, you know, like that, and say, I don't want to plug into the solar thing, I won't have to, right? Right. That particular facility, but you continue have to, you can have to continue to support the state's state energy policy and continue to pay into that. So you today on your bill today, you are paying money to the state energy policy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's not coming from tax dollars. It's coming from every customer. That's why I say ninety million dollars a year comes just from Central Hudson customers, and and so regardless of where it takes place in the state, um, those if you follow what if you extrapolate what what's proposed, you know that ninety million dollars could, could go to like three hundred million dollars for our customers. And as Anthony points out, what we're really saying is. You know, let's make sure we're looking at every opportunity to be able to achieve what we want to achieve without, you know, devastating our customers. And, it, you know, and because we're already paying for that. We're now, already paying right? 90 million a year every right. single year. I and mean, that goes from Central Hudson right to the state. Goes from the customers state we collect it for the state. The state tells us what to collect. We collect it from our customers. And when the state says send us the money, we send them the money. And what do they do with it? So that's. You know, that's what goes towards the incentives. You, um, your friend oh, who has a rooftop solar, he yes. got a big incentive. They right. create clean energy programs, oh, right. essentially. Yes. And so oh, they yeah. decide what portfolio okay. programs right. they're going to run. Okay. And that's the funding they use from all customers through okay. utilities yeah. collections. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, great. Um, okay, do you get on another topic you, you want to, because uh, I got a couple. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think, you know, there's, um, you know, one other thing that I think is really important to talk about um, is um, natural gas. Um, you know, we're a gas and electric yep. utility. And, you know, we, we absolutely believe that natural gas is really foundational to be able to move to, to clean energy. Um, when you look at what's going on today, it's not very sunny out. You know, it's pretty windy out. Um, and you know, with the with the winds that occurred, there were a lot of trees that came down. You know, this, when you think about what's really important to customers, it's reliability and resiliency of the system. And if a system becomes heavily dependent upon what I'll call more fragile generation, which may be wind and solar versus you know central power plants, um, you really um, can under st- extreme weather conditions um, have a real problem when it comes to reliability and resiliency. I may be able to put all the wires. Back up. When solar fields get damaged and windmills get damaged, there's no generation. Like I said, I've been with this company for 37 years. I've gone through some major, major storms. And never in a major storm have we been in a position where generation wasn't available since that wire went back up. Right. And I said, you know, I think we have to be really, really careful of the unintended consequences. It's really easy to say that, you know, this is the way to go. But when we look at the extreme weather patterns that we've seen, some of the damage we've seen, you know, when you, if you get three or four feet of snow on the solar panels in the winter, you're not seeing generation because somebody goes, goes and clears them, and then the sun decides to come out again. Um, I can tell you on March 15th of this year, you know, India Point, um, which has two units um, online, it was down for maintenance, the second unit trip up line, um, and it wasn't for uh, 
gas and combustion turbines um, outside of the New York City area due to lost power to Westchester and portions of New York City. The wind wasn't blowing on those days and the sun wasn't shining. Um, and it's absolutely foundational for those types of resources to really be viable alternatives. So, wouldn't that be an issue for you when you build solar farms? So, you know, the, the position that uh, the state has taken with um, the legislation that's passed is to move away 100% yes. from um, any form of generation that is carbon based, that means no natural gas. So, what, what are you left with? You know, other than wind, solar, and nuclear. And the nuclear, like I said, the nuclear agreement of state makes a 12-year agreement. You know, so, so the legislation that, that, that I'm proposing, or already passed, you're saying, right? Yes. Or would not allow central housing to do natural gas. To right, right now, the, the legislation essentially says it's moving carbon-free, carbon-free, yes. you do not burn natural gas. Um, and you know, carbon carbon free um, generation, uh, which also means that you know we also want to be carbon free from home heating and things of that nature. So um, that legislation should really, if you read it, if you say is not a natural gas. Because it's a hundred percent renewable by twenty forty, and that, that's the key. Huh? It's renewable on the electric generation system by twenty forty. What Charles is suggesting is natural gas is so foundational because the intermittency of solar and wind, right? Solar is not working at night. What's going to be your base load production to make sure you have power when you need power? Right now, energy storage isn't cheap or ubiquitous. Someday, maybe. And so, as technology changes, will evolve. But right now, we set out an aspirational plan. And as an electric gas utility, we have a plan to make sure you save reliable power. Natural gas goes out the way. There's no quick generating fuel that near the intermittency of wind and solar any better than natural gas. Because you start it up. But they want the state says that it is worthy. They, they don't want anybody yeah. to use natural gas anymore. So they're making right. large assumptions on technology advances. We see today, we may be there in 10 years. Like, yeah, it's just like $10 million for a new gas. Right. All right. Over the right. Right. And, yeah. and under this, under this uh, law that they passed, they, they, they won't have any gas on. So, is that right? Well, no, that's, 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 that's what they That's the goal. So it's not a very separate generation. Yeah. Right. Yeah, also, because gas is not Right, right. So, it is your right. understanding that this shuts off the gas. Yeah, so, um, you know, we argue that it is foundational and customers should have that choice, but we also argue that it is, it is you know, cleaner than burning oil. And if you look at um, the Hudson Valley, you know, the predominant home heating source is oil and not natural gas. And so, we believe there's a real opportunity to be able to convert customers over from oil to natural gas. Now, you could can convert over to to um, uh, uh, heat pumps as well, but you know the heat pump can be a very very costly alternative to convert an entire home over. Heat pump. Heat pump. Whether it grounds Sounds like something pump. I did in my dorm room. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be a measure uh, of electric right. conversion. But the Charlie points out, we have let's say eighty four thousand natural gas customers, right? Uh, we have 4,000. We have 307,000 total customers, right? Yes. So the vast majority of those customers are using a higher polluting fuel, fuel oil, right? Heating oil. Most people around here use heating oil as a primary kind of heating source. And so we think the state probably made a um, maybe not a, maybe not the best decision in, in saying get rid of all fossil fuels. When you look at the ability to convert fuel oil to natural gas, there are certainly large carbon reductions. In order to achieve that, that you can but achieve by replacing heating oil. oil is not renewable. No, no. no and so, what, what's your plan for that? And, and right. so, I think greater than just the electric generating sector, when you look economy wide, you can't achieve any of the state's goals as plan unless you go after the transportation sector and the home heating and commercial heating sectors. Right? Transportation is fully one third of carbon in New York State, and that's wrong. And so, transportation has to evolve off of gasoline at some point in order to meet these greenhouse gas goals that uh -huh. the state has. Very ambitious. Yeah. If you don't go after transportation, you can't meet the goals. So we're kind of uh, really focused on the electric generating sector now, maybe because it's the most intimate, uh, imminent goal in 2030, but you really have to go after transportation and it has to be a more this, holistic this, approach. It, it, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting the feeling that sounds impossible. It's it's like there's no it's way that, that people are going to stop using heating oil or natural gas 
And well, I mean, pumps. yeah. So, I mean, I think you know, people may not voluntarily do it, but when you think about um, you know carbon pricing and you know ultimately to get people to respond by um, pricing them out of a particular fuel and into something else, um, like solar. That's the only thing that's left, or wind. Right. Those are the. Yeah. Those so if are, I make the price of oil high enough through taxes and I make the price of natural gas high enough through taxes, you might say, wow, now it's economical. But it's only economical because it's unaffordable. You know, you're saying, OK, I'm gonna, I have to go to something because I have to somehow put the brakes on these high costs. So, I mean, there's a lot of challenges. I mean, these are very ambitious goals. And I think, you know, Anthony made a point that that I fully support is that, first of all, with natural gas, I mean, we use natural gas primarily through combustion. But, you know, let's not give up on technology. You know, I think if you're giving up on technology, you're pretty much saying everything good that's ever been invented has been already invented. You know, and when if, when you eliminate a fuel, when you take that fuel out of the market, you're really going to take away from that market any investment in technology opportunities because you're pulling the fuel away. But at the same time, there is no way to get to those goals that just, unless you take those things out of the market, the natural gas right. and, the, and the oil. Based right? on what we know today. That's and so they exactly may allow true. you to get into the solar farm building business. But they're taking the natural gas away at the same time. So, yeah, so the natural gas business, like I said, you know, I think while there may be that may be the intent, I think to have a reliable, resilient system, it's pretty hard unless there's new technology. I mean, so batteries uh, might be promising. What do you do to 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 because the law has already been passed, the, yeah. the carbon free thing, right. right? So how do you get? How do you Central Hudson? What kind of actions do you take to keep the natural gas flowing? Right. So I think it's it's more than ten million dollars. Right. So, yeah. so I think it's more than Central Hudson and what we need to do. Okay. Um, because um, my concern, um, kind of even beyond Central Hudson, is the economy of Hudson Valley. Um, any business that is interested in moving into the Hudson Valley, particularly when it comes to manufacturing, or particularly you know when it comes to large spaces where there's heating that's necessary and where there's an opportunity for good paying jobs is, is demanding natural gas. And so, you know, Con Ed declared a moratorium in the Westchester area because of limited resources. And the first people you heard from were the developers that said, you know, you're gonna kill my project. And if I'm a major corporation or if I'm a, a you know, somebody that's even established in New York State today and I have the opportunity to um, expand my facility or go somewhere else, but I need natural gas as part of that, you know, you risk the the uh, the opportunity for that investment to go elsewhere because of the uncertainty of the future of natural gas in New York State. So I think it's a slippery slope. I think you know I you know certainly believe that it's important to establish ambitious goals. I certainly believe it's important to strive for things. But I think there's a there's a need for a level of patience here, and I think we need to be sensible in what we're doing and not put ourselves in a situation where you know really devastate the economy of New York. People are leaving New York today. I mean, that's undeniable. Um, and, you know, I think people are leaving New York, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. But one of those reasons absolutely is is the cost to be able to live in New York State. And you can't you can't deny that. Um, one of those costs are high central Hudson rates. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and so the legislation does look at, because you asked a good question, setting very ambitious goals. They're setting up these climate action councils and different councils to deliver a plan to the governor by January 1st, 2023. That's where we think we need some patience to be pragmatic about what, what technologies are available and how achievable are these goals. And one of the things they'll be looking at as well are our costs and whether customers are getting shut off, whether they're leaving the state. We have to consider economic impacts. And I think this legislation does so have some off ramps in case technology hasn't evolved or we don't think these goals are achievable. So we caution everyone to have patience. And like Charlie says, resiliency is a big thing and having fuel diversity is really important. We have an abundant amount of natural gas in this country. We'd be foolish just by ourselves to say New York's gonna shut it off, especially if you're trying to achieve air goals with carbon and gas house, green, uh, gas house uh, emissions. And you're, you're not doing it as a single state. If you're doing it as a single state and somebody moves over the border to Pennsylvania or to the border of New Jersey, and they don't have similar goals or similar legislation, what are you really achieving, right? Your customers right. are paying in New York, but you're really not having the impact you want on the globe and the climate. So you have to, we'd like to see an approach where we can do this maybe even regionally or more federally, um, but we, we, we preach cautions and good planning as we move forward here as well. Okay, and it's a, I guess it, uh, to sum up your position, you can talk and things that you can reach these goals uh, without shutting off the gas. 
Well, I think um, natural gas is foundational to be able to continue to provide um, reliable and resilient service. I think it's also foundational for the economy of New, of New York. And you can't lose sight of the fact that Central Hudson has a large number of employees that work in our gas business. You know, And if you're really talking about eliminating that business, um, you're talking about eliminating those jobs. Thousands of jobs. Right. And that and that that and that's across the state, you know, and that's it, impactful. There's a lot of rhetoric around green jobs, and I think it's just rhetoric. And I think, you know, people need to really be honest about the fact that green jobs don't pay what these jobs pay. And and the green jobs, the volume of green jobs don't exist. Many of the green jobs that they're talking about being created, they're just reclassifying existing jobs. If you go to a solar field today. And you go out to that solar field, and I've been to some massive ones um, in the Arizona area. You don't see a single person there, not one person. It's the sun. It's just a big field. Yeah. Well, so when you go to, you know, a power generating facility, there are people everywhere, you know, doing important jobs. Um, so I have, you know, I think it's a real stretch, and I think it's a little bit disingenuous to be talking about, you know, uh, green jobs that really aren't adding jobs to the state, that aren't adding jobs that that are even offering equivalent pay. I mean, for example, if Central Hudson is allowed to get into the business of building solar farms, will you have to hire anybody to to operate them farms, or you just build it and let the sun do its thing? Yeah, I mean, I think from a resource perspective, it, we have resources today that, that would be necessary to operate them. So it's I mean, not going to create any jobs? No, I mean, it'll be, it'll be a construction, yeah. and then, the, you know, it'll be built, and, and, and then if it gets damaged, it'll get repaired, but there won't be anybody there every Hmm. And to be clear, we're all for clean energy. We want to get to the goals. We want to get there in a cost-effective manner. Though we are worried about that balance. Because some people will say we need to get there at any cost, but we know there's a reality in this economy, in this hospitality, that at any cost will not work. Especially if you're doing this by New York State alone, because you, you will not have that impact just at New York State level. So we really want to be balanced here in terms of achieving the goals, but at a reasonable cost too, because at any cost, I think may devastate our economy. And we are very concerned about that. Charlie said we've been here for 119 years, we want to be here for 100 more. Yeah. We've got to make sure we have a vibrant economy and people living here as well. So how did, and we'll get off this topic, but I'm just fascinated <laughs> by it. Did the state uh, legislature know about you know this, these issues before they voted to adopt this no carbon thing? Did they, know, did they, did they realize that, that we're, we're going to have to shut off the gas if we do this and we got to stop selling oil to people? Yeah, and I think I a mean, lot of it was aspirational, yeah. right? And so they, they've set targets very far in the future for some of these goals. And I think, again, technology may evolve and we'll see where it goes. What we probably don't appreciate in the legislation sometimes is that they did pick winners and losers from a technology standpoint. Like Charlie said, technology will evolve and they've made very prescriptive choices on how much solar we're going to have how much energy storage, how much wind, and by what time frames. Um, we don't know that that's always the best approach, uh, but they set aspirational goals. They wanted to send a message. They, they they did so, I think, pretty quickly. It came together near the end. And you wonder, that's why these councils have been formed to give a plan to the governor. I think it's by January 1st, 2023, to deliver the plan. And I think those are some of the things that are going to have to contemplate next, next few years. I mean, it's not just goals. It's, it's another to set. I mean, I had no idea that Central Hudson was not going to be able to deliver gas. That's a potential outcome from this legislation. Right. Right. And that's why we think we need to have patience and come up with a pragmatic plan. Again, it's not. But how does the legislature expect people to heat their houses? Electric heat. Electric heat. Yes. yes. Right. Right. I mean, not for nothing, but there are a lot of uh, disasters. Bills when it comes to electric <laughs> age. Yeah. Oh my goodness. All right. Um, well, anyway, so back to the, the, the uh, gas line project, I guess. That was a pretty big deal um, in the city because we, uh, people saw their roads being ripped up all over the place and got a little annoyed. But anyway, it, 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 people want things done, and, and when you do them, they want to complain. But um, we did hear about those uh, complaints as well. That is still ongoing. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, um, there was no consideration. There has been no consideration to hold off on this gas line project until we until uh, we, we 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 know where the gas business with Central Hudson is going to go. Right. Well, it's yeah, so most of the work that we're doing um, across our service territory. 
is replacing like for the most part of the end of the life of light. And so and the and life of gas pipe is pretty long. But um, in order to ensure that the system um, continues to be as safe as, it, as it's been for many years, there's a need to, to take an, uh, a systematic approach to remove, uh, I want to say, some of the oldest and the most fragile pipe. Um, so, you know, some the, of them like 100 years uh, old. Is that, is that some could be like 80, 100 yeah. years old. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it served us well and um, it served our customers well. But, you know, that pipe is at the end of its life and becomes very fragile. And before you have, um, a situation of urgency that you need to get in overnight. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's dangerous at this point. Okay. It's still safe. We want to get to a point before it, 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 you consider it to even be dangerous. Okay. That pipe needs to be upgraded. But you know, you can't you can't say, "Oh, I'm not going to upgrade it because of legislation." When we're really doing it for the long term safety and viability of the system. Now, if every customer along that section of line that I'm placing today said. I'm happy to switch out natural gas. I don't want it anymore. Then I would need to replace that. Um, but you know, customers aren't going to go and tear out the furnace and or their baseboard and put in electric. I mean, that's quite costly. Yes. Um, and you know, there's uh, and a boy or a bo or, boiler, or a boiler. A boiler. It's a big undertaking. Only people, right? Electric oil and natural gas. Or you could do a propane system too. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's what so, I said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so. Yeah, so, you, so I mean, um, you, we have to continue with that. You know, we can't say we're going to forego potential safety because of some legislation. We have to keep, keep moving forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, and we mentioned propane just now. Mm -hmm. That is, is 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 that a clean energy or not? It's not considered clean energy. So, so people can't wouldn't, under the, under these goals, you can't use propane either. Right. Only but, electric. Yeah, you can't even have a gas grill. Is that right? Well, that's you're burning carbon. If you want to be carbon free, you have a gas grill. Oh, that's never gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right? Really? I'm not sure you can have charcoal. But you might be able to have wood. <laughs> wood. Wood fire pizzas. So you, you know. yeah, so you gotta make I mean, fire pits in front right, of your house. So, so right. Put hot dogs on the exactly. Stick. So I mean, when you really think about what it's what the legislation is saying, all those things come off the table. You know, that's the reality of that's the extreme perspective of the legislation. Now, if that wasn't intended, well, they didn't mention that. They didn't mention it. Right. Right. So you need to do some um, central Hudson area, but I asked this before. I'm sorry. We're back on that topic again. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, and I think he gave an answer, but I'm not sure that what, what central Hudson has to do in order to stop the state legislature from allowing uh, uh, disallowing it to do natural gas. Yeah. What so I mean, I think it's yeah, just I mean, a we, technological thing. Yeah, but, well, so I mean, sometimes um, you know, the legislature doesn't doesn't like facts to get in the way of what they want to do. So um, you know, and you can never lose sight of the fact, while some legislators may, that they represent the people. Yes, and that's why why they're there. And so the people do need to speak up. You know, they represent the people of New York, and they're, 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 they are representatives of the people of New York. And if this is um, the direction that everybody in New York want, wants to move towards, um, then it, maybe there's nothing to say. But if they fully understand, you know, the, the I would say the unintended consequences yeah, or the true that's implications. That's what this is, unintended consequences. Or the true implications of the legislation, people need to speak up. Now, we've seen some developers speak up in Westchester. You know, we've because seen we've seen some people. I mean, just take on Long Island as well. You know, if true, if this, if, why aren't these customers? Why are these customers screaming to get reconnected to natural gas instead of instead of taking the opportunity to say let's move over to electric now? You know, I mean, you know, there's so, natural gas for heating, for heating, for their businesses, whatever it may be. So, um, in fact, e even you know, one of, one of the uh, um, I think local assemblymen that, that voted for this legislation spoke out about connecting these customers, which is a which is a little bit confusing. Yeah, but you know? I th but I think what we do with the legislation is we're not quibbling with the goals. We want to try to meet the goals, but in a pragmatic way. I think we do have to educate people as yeah. much as we can, like we're kind of doing today. Right, yeah. that's part of what we're doing. Right. We educate people. We think, because you said, ambitious targets. Other states in the country, like California, are starting to do this too. There will be technology advances. We don't know today what will happen, but I think there will be improvements in how we meet these goals will be modified over the time. So if we come back in five years, in 2024, I think we might have a different discussion about our plan versus today. But we have an obligation right now to plan a safe and reliable service, and we're 
also obligated to tell our customers what we think are hap- what's happening. We are really concerned about the balance. Everyone wants clean energy. No one's fighting it. But at what cost right now and how practical is it? We have to have a practical view of it. And again, as technology advances uh, increase, as battery storage becomes cheaper and more ubiquitous, we'll, we'll be modifying the plan and we'll see what fits into the resource. Well, you don't want to lose that natural gas, right? I mean, well, we are a gas and electric business. Yes. Right? You know, so yes, you know, if you're yes. growing electrification, you know, there's still business opportunities there. Yeah. You know, and we are you know, ensuring that our employees um, can be appropriately trained for the jobs of the future. Um, give employees the opportunity to transition over to electric if necessary. But, you know, we think that, you know, it, it's more than 20 years out before you're going to see that move away. But again, you know, like I, I've said before is, you know, I think you're dismissing technology, you're dismissing everything good that's ever been invented has already been invented. I mean, you can ultimately get to a point. I mean, when you think about power plants, you know, one of the ways that, that they've resolved emission issues is through scrubbers and, and, and other technology to kind of capture those byproducts. Mm. You don't know if you can get, develop those technologies at a very reasonable cost, even at the homeowner level. Is there yeah. a way to get the leg- uh, to get the New York State Legislature to amend this thing that they passed, the clean, uh, I, I, I think, and, and to say that this does not include natural gas? Yeah, no, I, I think what they have is they have some milestones here and plans to be delivered to the governor. I call them maybe off ramps and some. Uh, speed bumps along the way. And I think the legislation does contemplate that there's going to be working groups to dive into these issues a little more deeply, right? We passed a very aspirational plan. How do we get it done? And I think we'll see, we'll know more in a couple of years when some of these plans are delivered. And and that's where maybe there'll be some modifications at that time. I don't think there's any chance uh, that they're going to modify this legislation today. I think we'll let technology evolve and we'll let the working groups, which are spelled out in this legislation, do their work. We want to make sure we have a voice at that table and we're going to be educating people in that in this time frame. And then we'll see what kind of plans right. they come but out but with. But if this legislation set, uh, not not the date they said, say they set uh, yeah. 2021 mm-hmm. as the day we want to be, you know, yeah, it, would be it, impossible. Right. it would be impossible. Well, and so don't lose sight of the fact that it's legislation, which means then if you're not meeting, if you're, if yeah. you're admitting, you're breaking the law. Yeah. You're breaking the law. You know, so if I'm at my gas grill, right? When you're out there grilling, to do on weekends, when you're out there grilling, you might be breaking the law, and I could be fine. But, but we're not there. That's yeah, an extreme. Right. Okay, okay. Yeah. I just, so, right. yeah. yeah, yeah. That, All right. It is law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not just an ambitious goal. It's law. Right. Hmm. Okay. Um, we, I think it was was it last year at public service you got permission to raise rates. Is that right? Uh, uh, the, this was 2018. Yep. Uh, the State Public Service Commission Thursday approved the Central Hudson proposal that uh, raises customers' uh, mm-hmm. usage rates. Uh, but uh, um, and then, and then you got a, a time period here under the three-year plan approved by the Public Service Commission. Usage for electricity will uh, rise by one percent the first year, two point eight percent in the second, and four percent. Uh, in the third, um, I think it was before that though that you guys requested a, a one a, a, a giant size eleven percent in uh, rate increase, um, and that this was smooth smooth out. Um, Central Hudson has been known for uh, uh, or having high rates uh, in uh, in the in the state. Eleven percent sounds like a lot to me. How come you guys suggested that first? Um, so when we file for a rate increase, we file essentially for a single year. And so um, we are um, within that year looking to accomplish certain things and, and, and um, you know, this is the, the revenue we will need. One thing that should be clear is that you know anything that's considered an expense for us is yeah. a total pass through cost. We don't mark it up. So if it costs me, if the guy who trims a tree costs me $1,000 to take a tree down, you know, customers only paying a thousand dollars. I don't charge them, you know, eleven hundred dollars to take that tree down. So there's never any markup. So it's really, you know, the cost of doing business. So one of the big elements in that increase was um, adding about ten million dollars to our line clearance program. So we were spending about twelve to thirteen million dollars. Yes, no, the electric. The oh, line electric. Clearance, electric oh, okay. line clearance. So trimming trees. Oh, okay. Clearing okay. trees, you know, which is so important. It's a big cost, right? It's a big cost. And so, you know, we went from about $13 million a year to about $23 million a to year. To clear trees or the wires. Trees, right. Um, to, you know, and, you know, in Hudson Valley, 
is yes, a very, I'm, very lush um, part of New York State. It's a very lush part of the country. Um, when you get rain and, you know, um, and, and things grow and you get sunlight. And, and so, you know, they, those lines need to be maintained. So that was a, that was a, a big piece of it. Um, and then just kind of the cost of, of other services and materials and, and also some of the big projects that, that, that um, we have and, and the things that we're doing to, to kind of automate the distribution system. I mentioned earlier that there are more than 9,000 solar installations on our system, on our distribution system. And our distribution system, for the most part, was a system that um, was not, I want to say, a smart system, a system that, that we could monitor every element of that system right. and understand what was going on. It wasn't really necessary when there was a single generation source and you could kind of model what the system did um, and be pretty accurate. But today, you'd be able to model what's happening on 9,000 different installations where you don't have visibility of what's going on at a particular installation. You really need to create a smart system. So we've been investing quite a bit in our distribution system. We will actually have a distribution um, operation center that would manage and operate that distribution system, similar to what it does on our transmission system today. In fact, our plan is that that center will be built in Ulster County, mm -hmm. um, and, and we'll be managing the entire distribution system across all of Hudson Valley um, from from Ulster County when that's complete. Included in that is building um, network communications which is uh, fiber, both fiber we alone and fiber of third parties as well. Um, so, you know, a lot of what's taking place in the state, you know, we need to kind of upgrade our systems to be able to respond to that. You know, we have a major project to increase our computer systems to be able to provide customers all the services that they would expect from any major corporation today. Um, a lot more real-time inter interactions, um, be able to respond and really, I, I wanna say, create much more um, of a frictionless interface with us right. you know the systems that literally our main computer system um that we use today um that while it has been enhanced many many times it's been the same system for 37 years and it's now time to move to a new system so so those are some of the bigger projects that that were in there and so when you spread it over three years you know we really look to be able to kind of develop a three-year plan and that's really what you're seeing. Yeah, and I think when you mentioned, you alluded to the one, two, and four percent increases, yeah. and I think we're able to moderate that. And yeah. I think the value that customers get with the modernization of everything we're doing, when you look at a customer's bill, you're still talking about a, about a hundred dollars a month, which again, I know people, every bill is important, but when you start looking at the value that you get for providing you electric, to your home, mm -hmm. and you compare that to even your cable bill or your your mobile phone bill these days, we still think we provide a very good value. And we had 12 signatories to that three-year rate agreement at those increases, and I think we worked really hard to, to strike that fair balance that we're looking for, like in clean energy as well, to say we're making major investments to improve things for customers, but we're also doing it in a very cost-effective manner. And I think having all the signatories that were at that table sign on to that deal also kind of showed that, that we really worked in good faith to provide good value for our customers here. And I think our services still provide good value. Um, you mentioned the money for the cutting of the trees. What was it? Uh, 23 million? million. 23 million a year. To clear trees off wires. And I know you've heard well, this We try before. to get them before they get on the wires. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know you've heard this before. And I think Central Hudson has said uh, it's just impossible. But, you know, somebody might say, well, bury the wires. Right. And, and that is an option. It, and, but, uh, but when you look at what's cost effective for consumers and what provides the most sense, and we talk about what people would need to pay for, you know, what, what we believe we're taking is an approach that is the most economical approach. And the cost to a consumer, given the fact that putting wires underground, which is considerably more complicated for a variety of reasons, um, you know, it's, it's about a million dollars a mile. And there's a lot of miles out there. You know, and to be quite frank, if um, what's less expensive per customer is for a customer to go out and buy their own generator than it would be to pay the costs associated with the To bury the wires. Yeah, to bury the wires. Mm. Um, uh, other places have done it? Uh, no, utilities I, I in the country have well, done so, it? No? So, I, I, so where it is economical and where it does make some sense is in, in major metropolitan areas. Okay. And because there's many, many facilities underground. In fact, um, you know, there's almost, you know, there's underground networks that are Incredibly elaborate. Oh, okay. So, so it makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, you look, go to New York City, you don't see any poles. No. You know, the systems right. are underground. But right. into rural areas, you know, they don't have trees. In New York City? Yeah. They did once, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't anymore. Oh, yeah. And so, um, you know, it makes sense in those areas. When we go into new developments today, you know, many of those new developments are, are underground development. 
Yes, as well. But still, the main line getting there, um, you know, is, is a different story. And, and when you're in a rural area and you have large property frontages, it's costly to go from one customer's house to the next customer's house. Right. Um, right. Everywhere. You know, so, we do it in this. So, density and topography work yeah. against us here, right? We don't have high right. density and we have a lot of rock, which is very costly. And again, if we had constantly wide outs, uh, widespread outages, you'd say, cost effective to do it maybe, but we don't. We have a pretty reliable system. You gotta remember that. So what are you getting for that incremental, you know, yeah, percentage, right. you know, to go 90, rather, 90, rather, 90, rather, 90, It's not like a, the people are, unless it's a hurricane, yeah. right. it's not yeah. like they're out for days. And so, you know, not to point fingers at anybody, but I mean, you know, two major outages in New York State this year were both in New York City for extended yeah. periods of time, right. you know, and, you know, the governor was all over that. And, um, yes. and so, you know, it's not a, a system that, that has no outages. And when they, those outages occurred, you know, the implications of getting them back in service were pretty complicated. And so you're talking about, you know, you know, 80, 90,000 customers that are out in yeah. a single case, you know, for us to have 80 or 90,000 customers out here, that's a pretty major storm. Right. Yeah. Like so right. Sandy yeah. So like you know we you know we love we love to you know look in at our neighbor when we think um, their situation is better than ours, but when their situation isn't better than ours, we we tend to forget. And so that's it. I mean, burying the wise off the table. It's not even. A, I just don't even. think it's. I don't, I don't think it's a realistic um, option. Yeah. It's an option. It's you know. Yeah. Cost. You know. I per I personally think that you know at some point in time. Technology will, you know, be able to give customers the opportunity to be a lot more self-sufficient. Um, Hopefully, technology will allow you to keep your natural gas. Yes. <laughs> um, it's are okay. we good? Are we? Are we? Uh, we got about five minutes. Five Twelve. minutes. Yeah. All right. So maybe in that five minutes, you want to, uh, you want to wrap something up. Uh, yeah. So you know, one thing that I, I mentioned briefly, and I would just like to spend a little bit more time on, um, are you know, really the employees of Central Hudson. Um, very dedicated workforce. Um, How many? So we have, um, I want to say, 1,068 employees today um, all across the Hudson Valley, um, you know, in, in the field, um, you know, some days for some employees as much as 10 hours a day, but mm -hmm. around the clock coverage. And so we think it's really important to be able to ensure those employees are best prepared for all of these technology changes and that each and every employee is the best trained employee um, as well. And one thing that Central Hudson ha has lacked, which we are now um, uh, in the process of, of building, is a training facility. A training facility that will be able to allow our workers to be able to become familiar with solar installations or battery installations. Um, and that is that construction will take place in Ulster County. Um, it will be adjacent to our, our facility on 9W. Um, we hope to- Tunnels, so yes. Um, it's um, Tom Velsker. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and so it'll have to be a, a facility to train all of our employees in, in a variety of skills from um, those that work in the, in, in the office to those that work in the field. It'll also be a center where we'll be able to do some emergency responder training as well. Your fire departments, volunteer firemen are familiar with some of the things that are in the field. Um, we think it's an important investment in the Hudson, uh, important investment for us, but also an important investment. What kind of investment? So, um, so, cost. so, yeah, so while the costs aren't finalized, because it's really going to be built in three phases, the first phase will be our training facility, um, and then there will also be um, an emergency control center um, if, within that facility, and then we're going to be building the distribution management center to manage the entire distribution system, and then today our system operations center, which is located in Poughkeepsie, will also be located there. So really kind of um, the entire um, operations um System Operations Center will be located in Ulster County. The existing facilities today will serve as emergency backups. Okay, and how many how many total square feet would this facility be? Do you know? I know that's yeah specific. Lots of square feet. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to okay. be indoor outdoor. Um, yeah. So yeah. So it's a, it's a, okay. Is it before the government over there? I, mean, I think we have all, we have yeah all approvals have already oh, gone on that. Yeah, we're, about, oh, okay. we're getting pretty close to closing on the property, and we'll okay. be breaking ground next year. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Anthony, you want to wrap something up? No, I think Charlie said a lot of it. I think we've made our points. You know, we, we want to work with the policy uh, in New York State. We just want to do it in a really yeah. reasonable, cost-effective manner. And I think that's like there's a lot of changes going on. We embrace those changes, but we got to be pragmatic as well because we have an obligation to serve our customers. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming in. Uh, that was uh, uh, more entertaining than I uh, thought it was. Going to be. <laughs> uh, but uh, thanks for coming by, and you know, give us a call again, and uh, if you want to come in and update us on this, on 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 we'll on, yeah. on how this policy yeah. goes, uh, we would like to know about that because uh, it's going to make news, I believe. Yeah. Well, thank you for having us, and um, you know, say that you know we're willing to meet with any any group that would like to meet um, and hear more about what we have to say. Okay, thanks for the opportunity. Great.